20th, President Biden's son, Hunter Biden, agreed to plead guilty to federal tax charges and avoids prosecution on a separate gun charge in a deal with the Department of Justice that will likely spare him any time behind bars as long as he stays off drugs and behaves. President Trump and his Republican allies cry that the fix is in and it's evidence of the Biden administration's criminality. If you are the president's leading political opponent, the DOJ tries to literally put you in jail and give you prison time. If you are the president's son, you get a sweetheart deal. Federal District Judge Aileen Cannon in Florida sets an initial date of August 14th for the criminal trial of Donald Trump for his retention of presidential documents and alleged mishandling of classified ones. Donald Trump's Manhattan prosecutors say neither the former president nor his lawyers have shown any evidence to support their claims that the judge in his hush money criminal case has an anti-Trump bias. House Republicans with a resolution that condemns the use of America's public schools to provide shelter for undocumented immigrants. Coalition of Poor People Religious leaders and other advocates rally in Washington, D.C., calling poverty an American death sentence. And a federal judge in Arkansas strikes down that state's ban on gender-affirming care for minors, saying that the nation's first ban on such care for children violates the U.S. Constitution. From Pacifica Radio in the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Maracle. President Joe Biden's son, Hunter, will plead guilty to federal tax offenses but avoid full prosecution on a separate gun charge in a deal with the Justice Department that likely spares Hunter Biden any time behind bars. Hunter Biden, 53, will plead guilty to the misdemeanor tax offenses as part of an agreement made public today. The agreement will also avert prosecution on the felony charge of illegally possessing a firearm as a drug user, as long as he adheres to conditions agreed to in court. Kate Fisher reports. The U.S. Attorney for Delaware, David Weiss, who was appointed by then-President Donald Trump, agreed to recommend that Hunter Biden receive a sentence of probation for the tax crimes, according to U.S. news network NBC. Hunter Biden has agreed to enter a so-called pre-trial diversion agreement in connection with a charge of possession of a gun by a person who is a user or addict of illegal drugs. Typically, such agreements call for the related criminal charge to be dismissed if a defendant complies with the conditions of the deal for a set period of time. Donald Trump has criticised the plea deal on his Truth Social website, accusing the Department of Justice of giving Hunter Biden a, quote, mere traffic ticket. Kate Fisher, Washington. More from reporter Lindsay Whitehurst. The deal calls for him to plead guilty on two misdemeanor tax counts and allows him to avoid prosecution on a felony gun charge if he sticks by a set of conditions that will be set by prosecutors. The deal ends a long-running five-year Justice Department investigation into the taxes and foreign business dealings of President Biden's second son. It dates back to a period in Hunter Biden's life where he has acknowledged struggling with addiction to drugs, especially crack cocaine, after the death of his brother. And it involves both his business dealings and um, a, a short period in 2018 where he possessed a handgun despite being a drug user, which is against federal law. Two people familiar with the investigation said the Justice Department would recommend 24 months of probation for the tax charges, meaning Hunter Biden will not face time in prison. But the decision to go along with any deal will be up to the judge. 
Hunter Biden is to plead guilty to failing to pay more than $100,000 in taxes, over $1.5 million in income in both 2017 and 2018, charges that carry a maximum possible penalty of a year in prison. The back taxes have been reportedly paid since. The plea deal averts a trial that would have generated days or weeks of distracting headlines for a White House that is strenuously seeking to keep its distance from the Justice Department. The president asked about the development at a meeting on another subject in California today, said simply, I'm very proud of my son. The White House Counsel's Office said in a statement that the President and First Lady Jill Biden love their son and support him as he continues to rebuild his life. While the agreement requires the younger Biden to admit guilt, the deal is narrowly focused on tax and weapons violations rather than anything broader or anything tied to the Democratic president. But former President Donald Trump and his Republican allies are trying to use the case to show what they claim is the criminality of Joe Biden himself and to raise questions about the independence of the Biden Justice Department. Sagar Megani reports. Congressional Republicans are blasting the Hunter Biden plea deal, which comes days after the Justice Department indicted Donald Trump. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and others use the same phrase. It continues to show the two-tier system in America. Saying while the government is trying to put President Biden's top political opponent in prison. If you are the president's son, you get a sweetheart deal. Trump himself says on social media the agreement to resolve Hunter Biden's case is a mere traffic ticket. Other Republicans call it a slap on the wrist. McCarthy says the House GOP's investigation of what it calls corruption in the Biden family's business dealings will continue. Sagar Magani, Washington. District Judge Aileen Cannon has set an initial date of August 14th for the criminal trial of Donald Trump for his retention of presidential documents and alleged mishandling of classified ones. However, if that date very well could change in a written order, Judge Cannon notes the parties could ask to push back the trial date because of the complexities of the case and the issues related to classified information, both of which might draw out the timeline to trial. The initial trial date puts the case on a speedy track with arguments for the parameters of the jury trial being made by the end of July. William Denislow reports. Analysts say an August court date could be unlikely, with plenty of pre-trial posturing expected before the historic trial gets underway. But rules of procedure are being ironed out. According to court filings, Donald Trump's legal team has been told not to release evidence to the public. The former president is accused of illegally holding on to classified documents after leaving office and obstructing an investigation on the issue. Trump has pleaded not guilty to the 37 counts and calls it a politically motivated witch hunt. Speaking on Fox News this week, he said he hadn't had time to go through the boxes at his Florida home because he was busy. William Danslow, New York. Donald Trump's Manhattan prosecutors say neither the former president nor his lawyers have shown any evidence to support their claims that the judge in his hush money criminal case has an anti-Trump bias. They urge the judge to reject defense demands that he step aside from the case. The opinion, issued May 4th by the state's Advisory Committee on Judicial Ethics, suggests Judge Juan Manuel Mershon may have sought the panel's input as he wrestled with the gravity of his role in the case and nagging concerns that he could be seen as having a bias or a conflict of interest. Trump's lawyers contend Mershon, a state court judge in Manhattan is biased because his daughter is a political consultant whose firm has worked for some of Trump's Democratic rivals, and that some of his rulings in two prior Trump-related cases have shown a pro-prosecution bent. Matthew Colangelo, a senior counsel to District Attorney Alvin Bragg, agreed that neither issue was grounds for Judge Mershon to step aside. 
He painted Trump's recusal motion as the latest in Trump's prolific history of baselessly accusing state and federal judges around the country of bias. The decision of recusal is up to Judge Mershon himself. Norman Hall has more. Norman Hall. Manhattan prosecutors say neither former President Donald Trump nor his lawyers have shown any evidence to support their claims that the judge in his hush money criminal case has an anti-Trump bias. The prosecutors urged Judge Juan Manuel Mershon to reject defense demands that he step aside from the case. Trump has referred to Mershon as a Trump-hating judge. The decision on recusal is up to Mershon himself. He previously rejected a similar request when Trump's company, the Trump Organization, was on trial. I'm Norman Hall. An effort to disbar a right-wing attorney who devised ways to keep President Donald Trump in the White House, despite his losing the 2020 election, began today in Los Angeles. Attorney John Eastman faces 11 disciplinary charges filed by the State Bar of California stemming from accusations he assisted Trump in an effort to overturn the legitimate results of the 2020 election. Julie Walker reports. Attorney John Eastman is expected to spend the day testifying before the State Bar of California. He faces 11 disciplinary charges stemming from accusations he assisted Donald Trump with a strategy not supported by facts to overturn the legitimate results of the 2020 election won by Joe Biden. Eastman's attorney says his client disputes every aspect of the allegations. This comes as special counsel Jack Smith continues his investigation into efforts by Trump and his allies to overturn the results of the 2020 election, which is separate from his classified documents case against Trump. I'm Julie Walker. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA, Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online, kpfa.org. President Joe Biden, on day two of his visit to the San Francisco Bay Area, gathered a group of technology leaders in San Francisco to debate and discuss the risks and the promises of artificial intelligence. Gilles Martel reports. The Biden administration wants to understand and get ahead of the rapidly growing technology. The administration is looking at ways to regulate artificial intelligence in a way that allows it to develop its potential for economic growth and national security while protecting against its potential dangers. My administration is committed is committed to safeguarding America's rights and safety, from protecting privacy to addressing bias and disinformation, to making sure AI systems are safe before they are released. The sudden emergence of AI chatbot ChatGPT and other tools has jump-started investment in the sector. AI tools are able to craft human-like text, music, images, and computer code. This form of automation could increase the productivity of workers, but experts warn of numerous risks. UC Berkeley computer science Stuart Russell said in a talk at UC Berkeley last April that society should develop the technology carefully. I think AI has vast potential and that creates unstoppable momentum. But if we pursue this in the standard model, then we will eventually lose control over the machines. You take a different route that actually leads to AI systems that are beneficial to humans. He also urged technology companies to be more cautious about how they are building AI and he called on the governments of the world to regulate the technology. He said AI must be taken as seriously and become as regulated as aviation and nuclear power. Other experts also warned that the technology could be used to replace workers instead of just improving productivity. Artificial intelligence has already been used to create false images and videos and has also been used to spread disinformation that could undermine democratic elections. Governments as well as the European Union have said they are determined to regulate and control the development of AI before it is too late. President Biden said that his administration is already taking action to regulate AI. Earlier this year, I signed an executive order to direct my cabinet to root out bias in the design and use of AI. And in May, we announced a new strategy for funding for responsible AI development 
so Americans can lead the way and drive breakthroughs in this critical area. Biden said officials are meeting two to three times each week to discuss the issue and federal agencies are also monitoring the technology. The administration has asked private companies to commit to addressing the possible risks of AI. Biden also called on Congress to pass laws that impose strict limits on personal data collection and other protections. For a KPFA News, I'm Gilles Martel. The House of Representatives Rules Committee today took up a resolution that condemns the use of public schools to provide shelter to undocumented immigrants. The safety and education of our school children should be paramount, said Republican Virginia Fox of North Carolina, calling the Democrat public facility asylum policy unsafe and anti-education. Open border policies are dangerous. It's bad enough that the leading cause of death for adults under 45 is now fentanyl overdose because of a wide open southern border. We shouldn't let Democrats also endanger young children by forcing them to share gymnasiums with unidentified migrants. The resolution, introduced by Republican Representative Maria Annette Miller Meeks of Iowa, specifically calls out New York City which back in May temporarily converted several current and former school gyms to house some 300 migrants. The resolution also criticizes the Biden administration for ending a pandemic-era immigration restriction known as Title 42 that immediately expelled migrants due to the COVID-19 public health emergency, which has now been declared over. Democrat Jim McGovern of Massachusetts. If these were victims of a natural disaster, a fire, flooding, a building collapse, we wouldn't hesitate to provide temporary shelter in school gyms and other available public facilities. So really, this legislation comes down to the fact that Republicans would rather demonize people than do something to help them. Democrats argued that public schools have a long history of being used as emergency shelters, particularly when there is a natural disaster. They add that FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security list schools, places of worship, and community centers as designated shelters in emergencies. The resolution is likely to pass the full House of Representatives, but is likely dead on arrival in the Senate, where Democrats have a slim majority. At least one and a half million people in the United States have lost their health care, their Medicare benefits, since the pandemic-era expansion of benefits came to an end, many of them for failure to re-register for benefits because of clerical or bureaucratic reasons. Catherine Carley reports. More than one million people have been dropped from Medicaid so far this year as states move to end pandemic-era health care coverage. Avenel Joseph of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation says most people are losing coverage for failing to complete paperwork. When you rush through processes like this, which is the largest shift in health insurance coverage since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, people will fall through the cracks. Federal officials are encouraging state Medicaid agencies to delay procedural terminations for one month to better reach recipients. I'm Catherine Carley for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. A coalition of poor people, religious leaders, and other advocates rallied in Washington, D.C. today, calling poverty an American death sentence. They were joined by House Progressive Caucus Chair Pramila Jayapal of Washington and Oakland Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who are introducing a resolution called Third Reconstruction, fully addressing poverty and low wages from the bottom up. Christopher Martinez has the story. Poverty, according to a recent report by UC Riverside researchers, is one of the leading causes of death in this richest country in the world. A coalition called the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, held a rally in Washington, D.C. to call for an end to what they call murder by policy. The event featured religious and political leaders, as well as impacted people who lined up to make their voices heard. Today, poverty is the fourth leading cause of death nationwide. Nearly half of all the United States is poor or low income. 
and more than 200,000 people die each year from poverty, the lack of education, and the lack of health care. Poverty equals death. One speaker told of losing her job, then her health insurance, then her house. I have three degrees and six teacher certifications, and I am homeless. Sierra from Nebraska talked about not being able to work while her son is in the hospital. I should be worried about my son's health, not the bills, but I don't get that luxury. I shouldn't be sitting in the hospital hiding my fear of losing our home from my child as he recovers. This isn't the America I want for my children. We need change, and we need it now. As with many social justice movements, the day's event included a march to the Capitol building for a press conference. Or maybe not really a march, as Bishop William Barber, a Poor People's Campaign co-chair, told a police officer. Because it's a leisurely walk. We got, there ain't no march or nothing. We ain't got no sign. We ain't no insurrection. We ain't doing nothing. We just walk. And they told us we could walk. At the Capitol, Barber laid out the issue. Poverty actually kills more people than homicide. Poverty is deadly. It doesn't have to be. It's a policy choice. It's policy murder, policy violence. It does not have to exist. He says in other areas, like homicides or opioids, there's public attention and governmental hearings, but not poverty. People die from people pulling triggers and, and on guns, and we stand against that. But what about those who pull the triggers on public policy, deny health care, deny living wages? He says there should be a stronger response to the problem. We've got to have a, a hatred, a, a discontent. Something's got to turn over in our stomach yes. when we hear that poverty is the fourth leading cause of death. Yes. It almost ought to make us... A number of lawmakers joined the activists, and two spoke out. Democrat Pramila Jayapal of Washington is chair of the Legislative Progressive Caucus. Eradicating poverty is not just possible, it is essential. And that's why today we are here as members of Congress who are ready to stand with you, with the Poor People's Campaign across this country, with champions of the anti-poverty movement as we reintroduce the third res reconstruction resolution. Yes. This is our promise to you that we will yes. fight for poor people right. everywhere yes. in this country. Democrat Barbara Lee of California says there's a choice between the status quo or prioritizing the needs of our neighbors who are poor. And it's because of the policies, it's because of the funding priorities in this country where we're putting over $850 billion right. into the military budget. Yes. Come on, and cutting domestic programs. That's why we're here today to say no more. We will not be silent anymore. No, no more. No. Lee and Jayapal's resolution might not jump to the top of the agenda in the current Republican majority House of Representatives. But win or lose, it's just one step in a longer struggle, according to Bishop Barber. And we're going to use every moral tool. We're not an insurrection, we're a resurrection. Amen. Amen. We're going to use every moral tool. Now today you see this line, and we're kind of quiet today. Because Representative McCar Speaker McCarthy wouldn't approve a, a permit for us to be on the steps. But y'all see everybody else up on the steps. He said we couldn't be up on the steps. Okay. Today we'll stand in the parking lot. Today we'll do that. But this is not a one-day uh, moment. This is a massive movement that's building all over this country, and we won't be silent anymore. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders today opened a Senate investigation into Amazon warehouse safety practices. The move follows a series of probes Sanders has initiated against Starbucks and Moderna in his role as chair of a committee that oversees health and labor issues in the Senate. Sanders sent a letter to Amazon CEO Andy Jassy accusing the e-commerce giant of egregious health and safety violations. An Amazon spokesperson said the company has received Sanders' letter is in the early stages of reviewing it. He also said Amazon has reduced injuries across its U.S. operations since 2019, 
and has invested more than a billion into safety initiatives in recent years. Lawmakers in Maine are considering legislation to improve the wages and working conditions of thousands of farm workers. Current law requires farm workers to be paid at least the federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour, but they're not eligible for paid overtime. Catherine Carley reports. Andy O'Brien of the Maine AFL-CIO says the bill would ensure that farm workers are considered state employees, making them eligible for the state's minimum wage of $13.80. Farm workers work extremely hard. I use the blueberry rake, and it's backbreaking labor, and there's no reason why they don't deserve the same rights as other workers. The Labor and Housing Committee has advanced the bill, but some farmers have said increased wages and overtime protections could force them to cut workers' hours. Farm workers were intentionally excluded from benefits and protections in the National Labor Relations Act, which protects the rights of workers to unionize and collectively bargain. They were also originally exempted from wage and overtime protections in the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act. O'Brien says those working to keep the nation fed deserve better. This is a chance to really correct some of these historical injustices and and really improve the lives for thousands of farm workers in Maine. Only 14 states currently allow farm workers to unionize. O'Brien says farm workers in Maine should be able to discuss wages and working conditions with one another and outside groups without fear of retaliation from their employer. For Maine News Service, I'm Catherine Carley. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. Online, kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast that airs each night at 6 o'clock. I'm Mark Miracle. Russia launched a new barrage of missile strikes on Ukraine overnight, targeting the capital, Kiev. Ukrainian officials say the country's air defenses downed 32 of 35 exploding drones. The attack was part of a wider bombardment of Ukrainian regions that extended as far as the Lviv region in the west of the country near Poland. It exposed gaps in the country's <clears throat> air protection. Ukraine's Air Force spokesman said its air defense systems can't cover such a broad area. Meanwhile, Russia's defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, is warning Ukraine against using NATO weaponry to attack targets inside Russia. <laughs> According to the information we have, the command of Ukraine's armed forces plans to attack Russian territory, including Crimea, with HIMARS and Storm Shadow missiles. Deployment of these missiles beyond the zone of the special military operation would mean full-scale involvement of the United States and Britain in the conflict. This would entail immediate strikes on decision-making centers on Ukraine's territory. Meanwhile, NATO defense ministers met in Brussels to discuss the war and its military posture. NATO head Jen Stoltenberg. Today, we will prepare the ground for the NATO summit in Vilnius, where leaders will take decisions to further strengthen our deterrence and defense. We currently have um, over 40,000 troops under direct NATO command, with many more on high alert all backed by significant air and maritime assets. And we have doubled the number of multinational battle groups from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Stoltenberg also said NATO will not invite Ukraine to be a NATO member at its summit meeting next month. Another Russian neighbor, Sweden, continues to vie for NATO membership. Ukraine said that Russian fire killed a rescue worker clearing mud in the wake of a flood from a dam collapse in the Kherson region today. Seven others were wounded, six of them reported in critical condition. This comes as the United Nations accused Russia of blocking aid workers from reaching areas inundated by water from the Kakova dam collapse. The U.N. earlier rebuked Moscow for allegedly denying aid workers access to Russian-occupied areas where residents are stranded amid what the U.N. called devastating destruction. The Kremlin spokesperson says that U.N. aid workers can't go there because fighting in the war makes it unsafe. Ukraine and Russia control different parts of the affected area. 
UN humanitarian aid workers have been providing aid in Ukraine's controlled areas since the dams collapsed last week. Matthew Hollingworth is county director for the World Food Program. These are communities that uh, live right on the front line. Uh, they, some of them have lived through the temporary military uh, control of the Russian Federation. Um, they've lived through daily shelling, daily missile fire, rockets, the noise of this war, and now they're having to live through the effects of this terrible, terrible flood. And it's a flood that's going to have a long-term impact on these communities. They've lost land, they've lost production, they've lost their fields, and they are going to have to suffer because of this ecological disaster for many years to come. The UN's humanitarian aid coordinator for Ukraine said in a statement that her staff are engaging with both Kiev and with Moscow in a bid to reach civilians in need in the flooded areas. Meanwhile, a coalition of two dozen environmental organizations from around the world, including Ukraine and the U.S., slammed what they called the weaponization of the Kharkovka Dam and urged that it not be rebuilt the statement notes the dam's collapse killed 50 people, with upwards of a 1,000 others missing. The coalition said that the dam's failure severely affected the lives of hundreds of thousands of people upstream and downstream, impacted over 40 protected natural areas with dozens of endemic species, exposed or carried to the sea the toxic sediments accumulated in the reservoir, over these dam's 70-year history, inundated at least 50 settlements on both banks, causing mass displacement, and cut off water to over a half million hectares of irrigated fields. Restoring the area to a new livable environment, it said, will take many years if not many decades. The statement from groups including the Ukraine Nature Conservation Group, International Rivers, and River Watch says a small fraction of the area dammed for hydropower could be used instead as a solar power farm to generate energy at a comparable level, at a fraction of the cost to recreate the dam, which would cost, they said, at least a billion dollars. Today's statement opposing a reconstruction of the dam comes ahead of a two-day reconstruction conference in, U in London, where leaders and aid agencies are to gather starting tomorrow for the Ukraine Recovery Conference. Ashim Steiner, the United Nations Development Program Administrator, previewed the conference. At a press conference today, he recently returned from the Lviv region in Ukraine. The estimate right now is that more than 1.5 million homes have been damaged during the conflict, during the war so far, and thousands of schools and hospitals. And um, what uh, we are all doing in close coordination with um, the Ukrainian authorities, both at national level and at local level, is to rapidly deploy the support that is needed in order to at least quickly repair that infrastructure, which is possible to repair, to remove damaged buildings so new buildings can be constructed. He says landmines and unexploded ordnance are a major hurdle to reconstruction in Ukraine. Ukraine has now become one of the world's largest minefields with uh, both mines and unexploded ordnance, making it extremely dangerous to return to villages, to buildings, so working with our Ukrainian counterparts, um, the National Demining Service, we first of all are significantly scaling up the support in order to move into these areas, um, test the, the buildings and examine them in terms of mines and unexploded ordnance, remove them. And so far, I think it is probably an estimate, but roughly 543,000 items of mine and unexploded ordnance have been removed by the State Emergency Service of Ukraine with the support that UNDP and many others are providing. That um, has benefited 3.8 million people in terms of actually being able to return. The Ukraine Recovery Conference opens the first of its two days tomorrow in London. The United States today pressed its call for military communication channels with China 
and signaled concerns over reports that China plans a military training facility in Cuba following Secretary of State Antony Blinken's trip to Beijing over the weekend. Sarah Buran, White House National Security Council Senior Director for China and Taiwan Affairs, told reporters in a briefing today about Blinken's trip that establishing military-to-military communications is essential to reduce frictions between the two global powers. Buran said that it's an absolutely critical way to manage competition and to ensure there is not miscommunication or misperception about each other's intentions. Blinken said today that the United States would have deep concerns about Chinese military activities in Cuba after the Wall Street Journal reported that Beijing was planning a new training facility there. Blinken told a news conference in London that he had made those concerns clear to his Chinese counterparts. During Blinken's Beijing visit, the first trip to China by U.S. Secretary of State since 2018, the nations agreed to temper rivalries to avoid conflict, but there were no breakthroughs. China cited U.S. sanctions against it as an obstacle to military dialogue, which Blinken said he had repeatedly raised with his hosts and would continue to push for. More from reporter Simon Marks. Both sides were very measured in their readout of the talks that have now wrapped up in Beijing, agreeing to try and stabilize a relationship that has badly gone off the rails over the last few years. It was notable that President Xi Jinping agreed to meet the Secretary of State. That wasn't guaranteed going into the talks. And while there are still substantial disagreements between Washington and Beijing on numerous issues, analyst Carla Ann Robbins with America's Council on Foreign Relations says at least this is a start. Really, the most important thing here is that this is going to increase the chance that these two countries are talking to each other. And the other thing the Chinese want is they really want more economic contact, less diplomatic contact. So they would like to see Yellen come, the Treasury Secretary come. They'd like to see you know, the trade rep come, Catherine Tai. They also want a personal invitation for Xi to come to the U.S. and meet Biden during the November APEC summit. So maybe for them, this is an opening for that. It's been a really tense time, so talking's better than not talking. Mr. Blinken described himself as clear-eyed on China and said there are still numerous areas in which the two countries vehemently disagree. President Xi said progress had been made in some specific areas that he did not enumerate and described those developments as very good. With FSN Spotlight, I'm Simon Marks. In the latest incident of violence in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, two Palestinian fighters killed four Israelis and wounded several others today at a gas station near an Israeli settlement in the West Bank. Israeli police killed the fighters in a shootout. The shootings came a day after an Israeli raid in the Palestinian refugee camp of Jenin, which led to a gun battle that killed six Palestinians and wounded many others. Max Springle reports. The latest bloodshed is part of a spike in violence in the region in recent months. That's killed more than 120 Palestinians and at least 24 Israelis. The Israeli military said the Palestinian gunmen were affiliated with the militant group Hamas. Meanwhile, the United Nations Commission of Inquiry investigating the Israeli-Palestinian conflict released its second report to the UN Human Rights Commission today in Geneva. Commission of Inquiry member Chris Sidoti says the latest report focused on the restrictions human rights and other civil society groups face operating in the region. Our report examined the attacks, restrictions and harassment of civil society actors in all parts of the territories. That is Israel, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza. And we also looked at all duty bearers. Um, That is the government of Israel, the Palestinian Authority, uh, and to the extent to, to which it is relevant, the de facto authority in Gaza, Hamas. The report found that civil society groups face severe restrictions on their work from Israeli authorities, the Palestinian Authority, and Hamas. According to the report, members of civil society groups have been detained and in some cases tortured. Again, Commissioner Chris Sadoti. We found that the majority of violations are being committed by the Israeli authorities 
As part of the Israeli government's goal of ensuring and enshrining its permanent occupation at the expense of the Palestinian people. Meanwhile, the United States and 26 other countries, including the UK, Italy, Kenya, and Hungary, released a statement criticizing the Commission of Inquiry as biased against Israel. The violence and the release of the report come as the Israeli government over the weekend approved the building of more than 4,500 new housing units in the occupied West Bank and named controversial far-right finance minister Bezalel Smotrich to oversee settlement policy there. He's called for the complete annexation of the area in the past. The United States and other nations condemned that move as making a negotiated two-state settlement much more difficult. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. Each June 20th, the world commemorates World Refugee Day. It's a United Nations-designated day to acknowledge people around the world who have been forced to flee natural disasters, economic insecurity, and war. Today, millions of Palestinians still remain refugees from the conflict that arose during the formation of the State of Israel 75 years ago in 1948. Some five and a half million of them live in the West Bank, occupied by Israel, Gaza, and neighboring countries like Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. Rami al Magari files this report from a refugee camp in Gaza. Here in the Jabali refugee camp, 80-year-old Mustafa Shilayan has lived since 1948. He has a total of 50 children and grandchildren, all living in a four-story building here. He says that he still dreams of returning to the land of his ancestors in the historical Palestinian village of Yebna. Shalail is a retired electrician. He takes care of an electric workshop of his own in the Jubala camp's marketplace. I have spent the whole of my life, 80 years, to own a house of 300 square meters and a shop of 100 square meters, a total of 400. My family and I left behind two plantations, one of 2.5 acres around our village house and another of 10 acres located on the village valley. Please imagine what life this could be for a person in my position. The Jabalia refugee camp now has new buildings and has been urbanized. Tens of thousands of Palestinian refugees live in narrow alleys, like the one where 82-year-old refugee Enshara Halaraj from the historical Palestinian city of Jaffa lives. Enshara is now living here with her 58-year-old widowed daughter, Fatima. We lived in humiliation in tents. However, connections between dwellers of those tents were way stronger than those in present times. I recall that when a neighbor had a dish of beans, they used to share the dish with close neighbors. But today, people are much more distanced from each other. Also today, those who can provide their families with food are considered to be the best. Munir Azayan, who also lives in the camp, agrees. He was born in 1971 and has experienced different stages of life throughout the Jabalia refugee camp. People used to love each other much more than now. All neighbors used to gather during weddings and condolence times. I remember that local refugee women, 40 years ago, used to carry on their own heads trays of flour, flowers, some sugar and chocolate to gift for the neighbors. In condolence times, they used to help with meals like supper and dinner for grieving neighbors. Such habits are no longer practiced these days. I also recall that my friends and I used to gather on some sand hilltops to enjoy chatting and eating watermelon. Monir's view is common in this particular refugee camp and in many other refugee camps in Gaza that are overcrowded. The Jabali refugee camp is home to 130,000 refugees living in 13 blocks and each block 
is 1,000 square meters made up mainly of alleys. Thirty-year-old Ismail Abu Jalil is an unemployed resident of the camp. He graduated in 2017 from a local university with a BA in an Arabic language media. For a few years now, he has sold second-hand shoes in the Jabal refugee camp marketplace. I'm 30 years old now. When the coronavirus hit the world, my generation of the 1990s decided to take to the streets to protest our desperate condition. But the protest was quickly suppressed by the Gaza internal security forces. I dream of a decent job and a suitable home, but I know that such a dream will take years to come true. Local estimates suggest there are more than 150,000 jobless youth and a majority of them are university graduates. Back in 2007, the Islamist Hamas party took over Gaza during a power struggle with the Western-backed Fatih party of Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. Since then, the international community has shunned Hamas and Israel has imposed a siege on the tiny coastal enclave. Since the early 1950s, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, known as UNRWA, has been providing essential services for refugees, including food, education, sanitation, and health. Faris Abul Jidian is a 32-year-old father of four children. Faris visited a dentist at the camp's UNRWA-run clinic for dental care for his five-year-old daughter, Amel. Actually, they all seem to be competent doctors. They always promptly treat us. I came today to check out my daughter's teeth, and the doctor assured me that she is fine. The major refugee organization here is the Jabalia Refugees Committee, which is affiliated with the Palestine Liberation Organization. The group complains that the UNRWA-run services have been reduced gradually over the years. The committee's complaint comes against the backdrop of a series of UNRWA's appeals for funding over the past several years. Majid Okasha is a chief of the Jabalia Refugee Committee. The sanitation center in the camp has not been working properly over the past 20 years. For instance, over the past several years, staff workers within the sanitation center have been recruited temporarily. Each new workers work for only three months. In addition, the sanitation services equipment is outdated and has not been updated in years. We continue to support the operations of UNRWA and we are always calling for providing UNRWA with needed funds. Majid adds that refugee food rations have dropped to 30% of what they once were and are being distributed quarterly or every three months. In the past, UNRWA used to distribute those rations to refugee households on a monthly basis. Back in 2020, former U.S. President Donald Trump cut off annual American funding for the agency estimated at 350 million US dollars. The US's annual funding for UNRWA is estimated to make up a third of UNRWA's annual budget. The Biden administration resumed US funding for the agency. On World Refugee Day, Palestinian, Arab and international representatives will meet at the United Nations in New York and are expected to promote more funding for the UNRWA. Talal Aukal is a Gaza-based political analyst. Aukal does not foresee a solution to the Palestinian refugee problem anytime soon and that a long-envisioned and U.S.-promoted two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is getting further out of reach. 
I do believe that the current coalition government of Israel, headed by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, is having problems with the Biden administration and other Western nations. In addition, the coalition itself has many internal problems. I do think that this current regime in Israel is the first nail in the coffin of that country. According to the 1949 United Nations General Assembly Resolution 194, all Palestinian refugees who were displaced from more than 450 Palestinian villages and towns back in 1948 have the right to return back to those areas and get compensated for years of loss and deprivation. For Pacifica Radio, I am Rami El Milari in Jabalia refugee camp in northern Gaza Strip. A federal judge today struck down Arkansas's ban on gender-affirming care for minors. U.S. District Judge Jay Moody ruled today that the nation's first ban on such care for children violates the United States Constitution. Moody, in 2021, had temporarily blocked the state from enforcing its ban while he considered the challenge to the measure. The law prohibited doctors from providing gender-affirming hormone treatment, puberty blockers, or surgery to anyone under 18. It also prohibited doctors from referring patients elsewhere for such care. The ban had been widely criticized by medical groups. A Kansas man is facing federal charges of making threats on social media to build bombs and carry out a mass shooting at a Nashville Pride event. The indictment unsealed today against a 25-year-old from Hosington, Kansas, charges him with two counts of transmitting an interstate threat about the Nashville Pride Festival and Parade. The event is scheduled for June 25th and 24th, an indictment says the man on April 26th commented on a sponsored Nashville Pride post on Facebook by threatening to make shrapnel pressure cooker bombs for this event. On the same day, he posted another comment that threatened to commit a mass shooting. The event will go on as planned. It will be fenced with controlled access, secured with bag checks at the entrance, and bolstered by security workers stationed throughout the festival. A new report from the World Meteorological Organization, the WMO, says Europe is the fastest heating continent in the world. The state of the climate in Europe 2022 finds Europe is warming twice as much as the global average since the 1980s. Giles Gibson reports. This report names Europe as the fastest warming continent on the planet, with wildfires, heat waves and drought all taking their toll in 2022. The WMO also says that glaciers in mountain ranges such as the Alps are melting dangerously fast. On top of all that, the eastern Mediterranean, Baltic and Black Seas are all warming at three times the global average. There is, though, one trend that's heading in the opposite direction. 2022 was the first year ever that wind and solar energy combined generated more electricity in the EU than fossil fuels. Giles Gibson. Hundreds of thousands of customers remain without power in the southern United States following a series of storms over the weekend that killed at least one person in Oklahoma and left residents sweltering in triple-digit temperatures with no access to air conditioning. The bulk of power outages were in Oklahoma, where heavy storms on Saturday night carried winds as strong as 80 miles an hour around Tulsa. Officials say about 165,000 customers around that city lost power. Tulsa Mayor G.T. Bynum said city officials are in contact with the Power Service Company of Oklahoma, or PSO, to get the power restored. They are working with uh, both PSO and the Oklahoma Department of Environmental Quality to get everything back up and running. 2,700 workers were recruited to help out in power repairs, some coming from as far away as New Jersey and Delaware to lend a hand. 
Tropical storm Brett headed toward the eastern Caribbean today as the region prepared itself for an unusually early hurricane and the torrential rains that are forecast. Jody Jacobs reports. The National Hurricane Center says in an average year, the first hurricanes typically don't form until early to mid-August. Tropical storm Brent, though, is currently carrying winds of 40 miles per hour and is expected to reach hurricane strength by Wednesday. Forecasters say it's still too early to know exactly where the greatest impacts will be. But as urging residents of Lesser Antilles, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands to monitor forecast updates and have their hurricane plans in place. Jody Jacobs, New York. Rescuers in a remote area of the Atlantic Ocean are racing against time to find a missing submersible vessel carrying five people on a mission to document the wreckage of the Titanic. The Titan submarine has only a couple days' worth of air left from its 96-hour oxygen supply that it had when it went out to sea early Sunday morning. The Titans, part of a mission by Ocean Gate Expeditions, carries a pilot, a renowned British adventurer, and two members of a very wealthy Pakistani business family and a Titanic expert. Charles de Ledesma reports. The submersible named the Titan, part of a mission by Ocean Gate Expeditions, carried a pilot, a renowned British adventurer, two members of an iconic Pakistani business family and a Titanic expert. Authorities reported the vessel overdue Sunday night about 435 miles south of St. John's, Newfoundland. Every passing minute, however, puts the Titan's crew at greater risk. The submersible had a 96-hour oxygen supply when it put out to sea at roughly 6 a.m. Sunday. That means the supply could run out by approximately 6 a.m. on Thursday. I'm Charles Stiladesma. A grisly riot at a woman's prison in Honduras has left at least 41 women dead, most burned to death and violence that the country's president is blaming on Mara street gangs that often wield broad power inside the country's penitentiaries. Most victims were burned, but there were also reports of inmates shot at the prison in Tamara, about 30 miles northwest of the Honduran capital of Tegucigalpa. So said Yuri Mora, the spokesperson for Honduras's National Police Investigation Agency. At least seven female inmates were being treated at Tegucigalpa's hospital for gunshot and knife wounds. Officials say French investigators raided and searched the Paris Olympic organizers' headquarters as part of a corruption investigation into contracts linked to the Games. This is the third straight time graft allegations have dogged a summer Olympics. The Paris Organizing Committee said in a statement, a search was underway today at their headquarters and it was cooperating. It would not comment further. An official with the financial prosecutor's office said the search was linked to two preliminary investigations related to the Olympics that had previously not been made public. Sunny skies are predicted for the San Francisco Bay Area, but continued cool temperatures with highs just in the mid-60s around the San Francisco Bay. Partly cloudy further inland tomorrow with highs in the mid to the upper 70s in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow. Sunny skies, highs in the mid to the upper 80s. That is it for the news tonight for this Tuesday, June 20th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening.
Tune in Tuesday nights starting at 7 p.m. with La Raza Chronicles, a weekly Latinx affairs magazine program with local and international focus highlighting the social, political, and cultural events affecting the Latinx community. After that, it's international jazz, Latin jazz, and more on bebop, kubop, and the musical truth with Avacha. At 10 p.m., it's the Reggae Express with Spliff Skankin and Tony Moses. That's Tuesday nights on 94.1 FM KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K24 8BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.